Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the final session of the Stadsmakers Congress. I do also speak Dutch, but this session will be in English. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm a journalist and moderator and podcast maker and a fan of Barcelona and a fan of Stadsmakers. Uh, I've been invited to moderate this session um, because of my interest in urban issues, but also because for 10 years I was a part-time resident of Barcelona and actually, together with one of our urban critics today, made a video blog about the then new super block in Barcelona. So it is absolutely a delight, also for me on a personal note, to be with you today and to remind you not to forget to turn your phones back on after the event. And to introduce the guest urban critics of AIR this year. That is Javier Xavi Matilla. Uh, Xavi is the chief architect of Barcelona since October 2019. That must have been an interesting time just before Corona broke out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Together with Silvia Casoran. Silvia, welcome, glad to see you back. It was with Silvia that I made the video blog about the superblock in her neighborhood, which was the very first in Barcelona. And Silvia is a mobility counselor for the district of San Martí and also a deputy to the chief architect's office. Uh, the idea is that uh, they will give presentations first, Xavi, then Silvia, and then we'll have a conversation of, uh, depending on how much time we have left, say 15, 20 minutes, and by then we will all be in desperate need of a beer. So we'll keep an eye on the time and please enjoy. Xavi. Okay, thank you so much, Tracy, for your kind introduction. And thank you also for the City Makers organization. For us, it's a great honor to stay here with together. Thank you, all of you. I cannot see you, but I know you are there. Uh, the idea, the lecture today aims to, to bring, I would say, a positive message for the future of our cities in a really critical moment for cities where there, it's under discussion if urban life will be a good life for the future. And the idea is to share with you what we are working on right now in Barcelona. We don't have perfect solutions, of course, in Barcelona, but we think we probably have some strategic approaches and also projects that can be useful for Rotterdam or can be inspiring for work all together. It's really important the cities will need to work all together in order to find new solutions for our challenges. Of course, we are facing really complicated challenges, uh, environmental, social, economical ones, but we think it's possible to improve our cities if we have really clear what the city needs to be, to, be, to be improved. Barcelona is a really compact and high-density city. We could say Barcelona is a city completely built. We don't have any more territory to increase our development. So this is what we call about the regeneration of the city. Regenerate, regenerate the city because we, our challenge is how can we improve this uh, already built city in order to improve their, their conditions. Some figures to compare Barcelona with Rotterdam. Barcelona city, in fact, is a small city. We only have uh, 100 square kilometers with 1.6 well, 1.6 inhabitants, but we are also within a metropolitan area. This is a larger area with uh, 36 more cities, 3.2 million inhabitants. Why? We don't have perfect solutions, but we do have really clear what we want to be our city in the future. Why do we need to regenerate the city? First of all, really important, urbanism has to be a tool to reduce the inequalities in our <laughs> cities. Of course, in Barcelona, we have important differences between territories in social, uh, economical, and cultural issues. So our idea is always to approach the urban planning and the projects in the city with the general approach in order to be aware where are the more uh, vulnerable areas in our city to improve their conditions. We have, we are both cities, Rotterdam and Barcelona, are global cities, and we have probably a, a, a 
important impact coming from tourist activities. In Barcelona, we are recovering the same figures before the lockdown period. We are reaching again about 12 million tourists per year. So it's a kind of positive thing, but also tourism has uh, its really hard, dark side of impacts. We can see the picture on the left and in a red color where the, uh, the tourists upload their pics in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the internet. And we can see on the right picture in that kind of blue and green and white area in the center area, the neighborhoods where the rental prices increased more than 50% in the last year. So this is one of the most hard impacts that tourism is generating right now in Barcelona. And it leads us to the idea that we need to reconcile uh, the global dimension, the global scale of our cities, but also with the human scale. Probably the cities has been focused last decades in order to create this global dimension from a market idea, probably. And we need to recover a focus even more in the human scale in order to be able to reconcile, which is the global needs of the city, but also the everyday life in our neighborhoods. And of course, we are in a really complicated moment. We told before, in Barcelona, we have had this year a six-month summer. So we already know which are the climate change impacts in our cities. This is not a drill. Barcelona declared the climate emergency last, uh, last year, in, 20, in 2020. This is a declaration who defines that we need to create a new urban model if we want to adapt our city to these new conditions. And we are approaching these challenges from three main strategies. The first one is about proximity. We need to promote, to increase this city with short distances where the, with our everyday life can be done in a short distances area. We, when we talk about proximity, the first thing that we need to take into account that we need to be able to provide an affordable housing for everyone in our cities. In Barcelona, we have two really huge problems, problems with, with housing. The first one are the rental prices. You can see in this, this figure, the rental price, prices has increased since the, the, the beginning of the century to a really high level. There are many families in Barcelona that have problems to afford these rental prices. So we are making, you will see later, efforts in order to avoid. And the second uh, huge problem with social housing, we have a really important shortage of social housing in Barcelona. We only have a 2% of the 800,000 dwellings that we have in our, in our city. So the current efforts are focused in how to increase the social housing stock around the city with different mechanisms, but also trying to distribute this new social housing all around the city, avoiding the segregation effect of this. So we have different me urban mechanisms in order to, to obtain new land for uh, new uh, social housing buildings, but we have also approved new regulations in order to get more social housing in new projects within the city, just in single projects in single, in single plots. And of course, we are trying to do that with uh, innovative, new building and structural system. This is, uh, for instance, one of a project that was built with these uh, ship containers. It allows us to go faster in order to provide more social housing uh, within this emergency situation that we have. This is one of the uh, buildings that was awarded in the first new European Bauhaus edition. We are also trying to promote another kind of, of, of initiatives, just uh, reaching agreements with different social providers and generating collective housing all around the city. And we are also acquiring uh, properties all around the city. This is a really important strategy for us. In fact, we have a, a right where there is a proposal of selling any, any building in the city, the city council has the right to, to buy it for the same price. So this allows us to, to get social housing in these red spots uh, distributed in some areas uh, where in another way it will be impossible to, to create new affordable housing. We are also talking of how can we create a polycentrical 
uh, urban fabric, a polycentrical city, Barcelona, from its origin. This is the picture of the uh, Sardar plan in the middle of the 19th century. Was already a polycentrical city. We, we can see the different village that there already exists before the Chambla Sardar. These villages has become the current districts in the city of Barcelona, so the 10 districts of the city has a historical center that uh, we could say uh, is understood as a, as, a central, as a central area. It has been an idea that has been repeated in different historical urban planning projects in the city. This is the map that defined the new urban centralities that made possible the Olympic projects in the 1992. In, in red one, we can identify which were the four areas that allow the new sport facilities for the Olympic Games, and in the yellow one, was again a strategy to create new urban centralities in different neighborhoods, providing services, uh, facilities that were alike on those territories. And these are current maps of the city of Barcelona. We are really, we really like to show that that's maps. The, the above one is the map of the public markets in Barcelona, that can show pretty well well all the, dis the, the good distribution of the of the markets all around the city, and the picture below are the, is the map of the public libraries in Barcelona. So the city council has made really important efforts last decade in order to provide all the neighborhoods around the city with the main facilities that they need. We could say, basically, Barcelona could be considered right now a 15-minute city or short distances city, but we already have some urban areas that we are increasing the force in order to continue promoting that mixed-use condition that can generate this proximity uh, idea. This is the 22 Arroba. In the, it was the former area, uh, the former industrial area of, of I'm trying to, <laughs> to, to use the laser, but there is no laser, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 22 Arroba was the former industrial area there in Barcelona. There was a plan in, the, in 2000 that trying to promote the creation of new technological activities, economical activities. But the problem with that plan was that it only uh, defined 10% of the new edificability for housing. We have been working last year in a new plan, and there have been really important efforts working all together with the different neighbor, neighborhood, neighbors association, also with the different economical associations, in order to define a new plan that was approved last year. And the idea is how can we increase the housing uh, balance, the, ho the housing share in the different uh, transformation. And another important idea is that we can create this mixed-use city without demolishing. So the idea is that, that this new plan creates a new regulation that allows different strategies. We can see the pictures below uh, for addition, for complement the existing industrial buildings without demolition, just overlapping different uses, different architectures. The second strategy, uh, we call, we need, of course, naturalize our, our cities, but the idea of naturalize is that we need first, uh, first to increase the green areas to stop, to stop pollution. We have a, a nature plan uh, who's, who has established which are the goals of how much green we need to increase next year, how we, need, how we need to promote biodiversity in these green areas, how are the protocol of maintenance of these new green areas. But the main problem in Barcelona, it could be not well known for everyone, but we are, are really, we have a really important lack of green areas all around the city. We have an average, the total average of the city of six square meters of green zones per inhabitant. You know that the WHO is, has established uh, an average between 10 and 15 square meters, so we are far away from the, from the good situation. But it's even worse in some neighborhoods, in red in this picture, where the level is even lower. We have neighborhoods with only two square meters per inhabitant. So, of course, we need to increase the green areas. We have different strategies, some of them linked to building, to increase the green areas, for instance, like we could see in the picture, in the rooftops, we have a program that uh, subsidizes private projects in order to transform all the terraces in Barcelona into, into green roofs. We are also promoting the transformation of that kind of blind walls that appear after uh, urban transformation into a new 
ecological or green, or green one. And we are also increasing the inner blocks interiors that has been transformed the last years in the, in the Champlain of Barcelona. We already have 45 interiors of those blocks that are already green. We are working right now, we think there are six more projects in our agenda for the next years. But we have, as I said before, a really important problem with air pollution in Barcelona. In fact, we can see in the, the diagram on the, on the left, we have more cars crossing the center of the city, uh, 350,000 cars crossing the center of the city every day. It means that there are more cars crossing the center of the city every day than the cars that cross the city by the, the ring roads. So we have a really important problem in the center area that obviously it can be also visualized like the air pollution that that kind that mud one of cars are generated in the center area every day. In Barcelona, we used to say we don't have uh, big parts, large parts. We only have uh, medium or small size parts. So basically, Barcelona is a, street of, is a city of streets. So if we want to improve these environmental conditions, we want to reduce pollution, we have to improve uh, our, our streets. And this is why Superblock idea makes sense in Barcelona. Because Superblock is about how can we improve our streets, and the basic idea is that we need to predefine uh, the mobility model in order to make it more efficient. That it means that the mobility needs less room in the public space, and the mobility creates less air pollution. So the idea of Superblock is not that generate uh, small areas, uh, we were talking before with some colleagues, is about how to generate a new street network model with different categories of streets in order to promote public transport, biking, walking, and in order to free up some of these streets for new social activities in new and new green areas. So the idea is that we want to improve all the streets of the city, not only a few of them, but all of them in different order, with different categories, always promoting public, public transport, biking, and finally identifying one of each three streets in the city that can become a new green street. That it means that it is not anymore a street for mobility, but it's a street for social activities to remain, to stay. And the first project that has made possible Superblock in Barcelona was the NES Network Bus scheme is the one that you can see in the, in, the, in, the, in the slide. This is the bus network is who defines which are the basic streets for mobility in our city. And it allows also to identify the other side of the project, that are the green axis, that are the streets that will, that is possible to free up from traffic through and can be uh, transformed into a green one. This is the vision for the future about Superblock in Barcelona. The idea is to create a new, a new environmental and a new social infrastructure all along the city, improving the local conditions, but also connecting the neighborhoods between them. Some projects are rapidly, uh, that, that shows what are we talking about. This is Meridian Avenue, one of the main axes of the city of Barcelona, connecting the center, the center with the northern side. Uh, Meridiana has been transformed last year. The idea is really, really, really easy, but really powerful. We have a really uh, uh, huge uh, asphalt strip in the middle of the street. We are introducing a new uh, sensor area, promoting, in this case, uh, bike lanes, new bike lanes, and also two new uh, three lanes to improve the, the, the conditions. This is who used to be Meridiana at the end of the 20th century. There was a first transformation at the, during the 90s, I think. And the transformation right now, this is a project that we finished uh, two months ago, before summer, I think, uh, where are, there appeared this new green area in the center. We can see some other pictures where it can appear some areas for people, for, for kids, viable uh, areas also. And there is another main axis that is under transfer, transformation right now. This is the Diagonal Avenue, the other main axis of, of the city of Barcelona. In this case, the strategy is the same. We are shifting from a section where six car lanes in the center that will be removed from this center position that will be transformed into a new tramway line and a new bike lane position. There are some pictures that are showing the transformation that is undergoing right, right now. And finally, Glorious. Park, this is the junction between these two main axes. It used to be a ring, an elevated ring road, we can see on the left, and it's being transformed right now in a new park. It's important to recognize that 
this transformation specifically of Glorious Park has been possible thanks to the different neighborhoods, associations that have been pushing to the, to the city council and to different uh, political powers in the city to, to reach this, this transformation. There are some pictures recent of the, the transformation that is under work right, right now. We have yeah, the idea to recover that kind of everyday life for people. I'm coming back... Coming back to Superblock, some pictures of the first period between 2015-2019, where the city set up the two first pilot project experiences in two neighborhoods. These are pictures from the neighborhood of San Antonio. You can see clearly which are the transformation that Superblock means in this area. There are the structural ones transformation. There are also tactical projects, we are following all the transformations with a monitoring protocol that allow us to get all the data and to show people that the goals have been reached. We are reducing air pollution, we are reducing, uh, reducing uh, acoustic pollution, we're increasing the green areas, we're increasing the social activities in these neighborhoods. And this is the, the vision for the next 10 years in the central area. We said before that, this, that has the most important problems of air pollution where we have identified 21 streets, it means one of each street of the Champla, the center area of the city, that will be transformed during the next 10 years into a new green axis one. We have started with the first stage of four of these uh, streets that are uh, working right now. I think we have some pictures we will show later. And this is really important for us, and probably it's I show to discuss with Rotterdam about the idea of a street. Because we think that beyond this strategical approach for this systemical transformation of superblock, there is also needed a new idea of a street. The first idea is that the street needs to be environmental infrastructure. So the street is a three-dimension space. We need to improve what is happening in the underground, what is happening in the surface, what is happening with the trees and the new canopy. But it's also important to understand that the public space transformation is always absolutely linked what is what with this happening inside the buildings. So what is happening in the ground floors? How can this public space transformation activate the, the public activities, the collective activities inside the buildings with retail activities, but also with public facilities? Is absolutely decisive for us. The third idea, like, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's visible. Innovation. It has to be about innovation. We are also working with different initiative, uh, companies, designers into new solutions of materials that allow us to improve the environmental functions of the different surfaces and, and pavements. Of course, the new street needs to integrate in the new project, which are the values coming from the landscape existing there, also from the heritage that we already have in our neighborhoods. And finally, it's a matter of accessibility. On one hand, from the universal accessibility for everyone in the city, but also an accessibility that can guarantee the, the access for the, for the public services, the emergency services, and so, and so on. Some pictures about the model, uh, what we are applying right now about the subsoil, the introduction of new systems that allow us to improve the water cycle management, retain water, to put water into the phreatic level, I don't know if it's it, to, to reuse it again in the, in, the, in the new public space. A new logical of the mobility management, if you can follow the blue line, this is the one for cars. Cars are not allowed to go ahead on the different junctions. They must turn on the left, on the, left, on the right, on every, on every crossing area. It allows us to reduce the amount of cars crossing these streets uh, uh, every 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 day, and of course we are also improving this uh, environmental condition, increasing the number of of, of, of trees. For to 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 have an idea in the next in the first stage that will be transformed five kilometers of the streets, will we uh, create new uh, 500 trees all along this street? So the idea is put the, the tree in the middle of the street, in order to improve their their conditions. This is a scheme that show how it will be a real canopy in the, in the, tra in the, in the transformation. And there is also the idea in the, in the crossing areas between these green uh, axes, we have a surface of about 2,000 square meters. It's possible to transform a really large surface of asphalt into a new square. We say the Champla is a neighborhood without squares, only streets. So it will allow us to create new squares for the different neighborhoods. And I think there are finally some pictures just showing uh, this is the curb 
the current situation two months ago of one of these streets, there were uh, some tactical intervention during the lockdown period, as there are the, the, the pictures showing how are we expecting to be transformed in the next month. And this is one of these new squares that shift from this idea to this new one with a, with a new little wood or a big garden in this area. So you are invited next, next summer in Barcelona. The, the, we are expecting to finish these works uh, the first trimester of 2023. So I'm sure... Before elections. June, July, if you visit Barcelona, you will be able to, to check. And this is the, the, the last project, and I will give the floor to, to, to Silvia. This is Let's Protect Schools. This is one of our more loved programs in the city. It's about the schools. The schools have a really powerful thing that everyone understands that we need to improve the conditions of the surrounding areas of the schools. And this is a kind of acupuncture strategy also all along the city. But I give, the, I give the word to, to Silvia. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Xavi. Well, as Xavi says, this is one of our favorite programs, if not the most. Here it's the map of Barcelona. You don't see the, the base, but it's there. And this is the location of the almost 600 schools from nurseries to secondary schools that we've got in the city. So you see they are spread all around the city. And we've got a very ambitious program that is called Let's Protect the Schools that is really putting the children in the middle no, of, the, of this policy. And it's to protect the children from the safety, not for, from the traffic, but also from the environment, to create a, a healthy situation. And we are, well, if possible, we go from the situation to the left to the situation to the right. We are now working with the first 200 schools. They will be ready uh, next year. We are now one, 130 they are ready now. And we are just taking away space from parking cars and away space for driving, no? car lanes, and no one is complaining. And we are so amazed. I mean, super blocks are always a, a big mess, no? the transformation of Meridiana, Diagonal, to connect that this tramway is connecting nine municipalities. The tramway in, the, in Diagonal is stocked since 2004. So 18 years of political debate to connect three kilometers of tramway that is giving access no, to nine municipalities in Barcelona. With every bike lane, it's always a discussion. But with this program, no political opposition, no media opposition. And this is tactical urbanism. We are using colors that the architects from last century hate. <laughs> architects from last century, right? Um, but this allows us to really be uh, fast implementing this measure. We are spending an average of 70,000 euros per school. And yeah, sometimes we can take all the space. Of course, cars are always welcome, but they are guests. Of course, emergency services and everything can go in. And sometimes we cannot remove all, all the space for cars, but then we can remove a, a parking lane, like in this situation, or a, the corner that used to be in Barcelona uh, meant just for parking four cars or five cars, so we can create this new public space in the chamfer. We also take profit not to put some more bike parks in Barcelona because we, there's a big lag, and especially in front of the schools, because the schools in Barcelona, we don't have this parking uh, for bikes inside, as you've got in the Netherlands. And the most important thing is that this new public space is not only for kids, not only for schools and the families, but it's for everyone. And this picture of these benches in Barcelona is really important because old people are only capable of working in the city when they've got availability of benches. And they probably need benches every 100 meters. We were discussing with some colleagues from Rotterdam about to compare how many benches we've got, because we really think it's an important thing for the active mobility of our elderly people. So, the third strategy. The first one was about proximity. Um, the second one was about naturalizing the city, creating you know, the, the better environmental condition. And the third one is, of course, citizen engagement. And because you like the American style, I think in Rotterdam. There's a, here a quote from Jane Jacobs. Uh, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. And this is something we are learning in the process. We learned in the, with the first super block that Tracy visited some years ago, that if we don't get the involvement from the citizens from the first moment, things will be much more complicated. 
Uh, so, of course, with the Superblocks project, we've got a specific strategy, a participatory strategy. We've got our own team in urban ecology department, where our uh, department be belongs, but also mobility and environment and urban planning. And yeah, we follow like a complete process. Um, well, we take our time to discuss with the neighbors. We create like a, a driving group with all the stakeholders that are uh, yeah, nearby, but we also open the sessions to everyone and we also go to find, to focus on special um, groups of interest, like uh, people with disabilities, like children, or like retailers that are very important, I think, I guess, also in Rotterdam, to get them on board and to get their needs on the, on the planning process, on, on the results. We've got an online platform where we put all the information about the participatory processes. It's the CDIM.Barcelona. And also citizens can discuss to each other. They can evaluate measures. They can interchange documents. And, well, we believe this is no, one part of the participatory um, process that is important, especially not during COVID, it was clear. But, of course, we like the most no, the, the presential uh, participatory process and the, the implication not of our uh, technical staff, but, but also of our politicians. Here, you can see our deputy mayor just behind Xavi, <laughs> uh, Janet Sand. This is in the, in, with the first superblock, the first test, the pilot superblock in Poblenou, where everyone was quite aggressive because they, it, it started as a university experiment and the, the neighbors didn't expect the changes. Of course, afterwards, they realized that they were good and they, they were defending them. But in the beginning, it was quite, quite hard. Um, it was in the Democracy Square, in the superblock of Poblenou that Trace visited some years ago. And the result of this participatory process in the superblock of Poblenó, it gave us many things. One of them was a vegetable garden, and a vegetable garden that is uh, accessible for, for wheelchairs, for instance. No? That is something that you may think it's not um, something to take into consideration, but when you get them this, no, this kind of disability on board, then of course you realize and you can design properly for everyone. This is also the, in the superblock in Poblenó. You can see here the podotactile pavement um, all the, for the blind people, because um, they like not to improve that we improve the city, but they they don't feel safe no with with this new uh, situations that we are creating. Because when you've got no like a, a, a sidewalk and a place where the cars are driving, then it's clear for them what's a safe place and what's a non-safe place. But when you mix, when you start mixing, no the the different um, um, well, states, uh, stadiums, um, they get confused. So even with the tactical urbanism, we of course, we take uh, this solution for, for them. This is with the new street model that Xavi was talking about. We also work uh, together with them to, yeah, to make clear where they wanted no, this polytactile pavement, where, yeah, how, what's the space we should get without any obstacle in, next to the facade. For, for instance, and this is a test because we, with the new streets, we, we just discovered some old tram, tram line ways, uh, tramways, and also some old pavement that was in place, and then we decided to keep it. But of course, the people with wheelchair, they, they didn't like this kind of pavement, so we, well, that's Xavi and the director of transformation, themselves testing no, how smooth was it, and it wasn't good enough, and they had to repeat the experiment. But then the, the, the people with, with on wheelchairs, they approved the, the new pavement that was the, the old pavement. Okay, and this is also a thing in Rotterdam, in all the cities, the lack uh, target. Uh, the people that we forget the most is the teenagers and the young people, also during COVID lockdown in Spain, we forgot about them. The kids until 12 could come out, and the kids, no, and the people from 18, they could come out, but the, <laughs> the population between 12 and 18 year old, for some weeks, they were not allowed to go out, only to go to supermarkets, so that's really proper for, for them. And we are trying to, yeah, to engage also no, the, the teenagers, uh, in the transformation of, of the city, but that's, yeah, that's quite difficult. 
but we, we go to high schools and then we explain the changes and then we get them on board to, to tell them, to tell us also their, their needs. And one of their needs is the picnic tables, for instance, where they can just hang around um, without, um, without any money no, to, to spend. And here, for instance, in the Superblock in Pobleno, you can see three teenagers doing just some homework. And of course, we were also discussing with some colleagues of you, know, when you put pic uh, picnic tables or benches, there might be other uses no? during the night, or the, but what, what can we do? We, we, don't, we won't put these kind of elements in the street because to, yeah, to avoid the bad use of this, or we should use different uh, strategies. And just to finish, um, we are also trying to innovate somehow together with, with the kids, and we are trying to co-create uh, different urban elements. This is an element that was created during COVID, for the environment of Let's Protect the Schools. And now this is becoming, after two years, a real urban element. We are just um, building it in, and the next weeks it will be put in, in place in the, in the street. But I don't know, Rotterdam, but Barcelona is really difficult to, you know, to follow all the steps to innovate with new urban elements that everyone likes it and that the maintenance team wants to, to hold it. This is also with uh, an, an, another new urban uh, element with sand, with compact sand. This is not concrete. Uh, so we are also trying to, yeah, to innovate with natural elements, also this one. And we are also, we want to become a playable city in, by 2030. We've got a, 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 an interesting program. And we also try to, yeah, to innovate with urban elements to become that all the city is playable and not just the, the playgrounds. This is also a project with um, children with um, neurodiversity, and we are also trying not to get them on board to get their needs for the new public space that we are creating. And this is the, the last picture, this is, which is really important in Barcelona. This is happening. This is a, a family movement that is happening every week. I, I know that for you it's not interesting because it's just people going by back to school, so this is your daily life. But they are really claiming the streets. They want us to create the safe conditions and the healthy conditions in the streets. And in Barcelona, we've got a lot of motorcycles. That what makes some sometimes hard to cycle in the just on the on the car lanes. But here you've got the motorcycles inside the bike lanes, and this is something because I am supposed to be a urban critic today. So this is something. Please, yesterday I was cycling in Rotterdam, and I felt more unsafe than in, than cycling in Barcelona because of the mopeds. Of course, they were going to the Feyenoord, whatever, to the to the match. But they, I felt really, they, they were really aggressive to us. And please put them with the cars. They are motorized traffic. I don't know who is here around, but... <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. <laughs> So my first question to you was going to be, give me some of your impressions as guest urban critics of Rotterdam. And we know now perhaps the most important one. Yeah, that one was amazing yesterday because I, I was, I'm used to, I'm cycling Barcelona for, I don't know, 25, 30 years already. And I'm used to, to fight with motorized traffic and to felt attacked. But yesterday we had like two incidents, one with a car. And I was like, come on, this is, this is like Barcelona, no? but I'm used to fights, so no problem. But then, <laughs> but then when, when, while we were uh, riding the bikes in the bike lanes, I felt no, totally uncomfortable. I know it's, it's, done, it's an, um, a feeling of safety or unsafety. No? I know it's, no? there are probably not real accidents or dangerous situations. But if I'm thinking no, of cycling with my kids in a bike lane, I mean... I wouldn't feel safe in Rotterdam because they are <laughs> not really. I mean, this is this makes you a, a, a really a special uh, city in the Netherlands. I've been cycling in many cities in the Netherlands as well, but really not like in Rotterdam. So please, let's follow the the, the situation of Amsterdam and Utrecht, no, and put them with the motorized traffic because that's what they are. <laughs> we have so many different traffic speeds now. Eh? With the, the cargo bikes and the electric scooters and the bikes and mm. the mopeds and the 
electric uh, buses and vans. It's, it's hard to know who should be where on the street. Our streets are not big enough. Javi, your uh, impressions of your visit to Rotterdam, biking in the rain yesterday, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the first idea is that probably Rotterdam is a quite difficult city to be planned, but different from Barcelona. We were talking just today, the, these geographical conditions with a lot of islands or areas divided oh. by water, it makes quite difficult to generate the con the continuity condition that a good city will need. So I think mm -hmm. we have our, the people who are in charge for responsibilities at the city council. I think a really difficult uh, city to, to reconnect between them, the different parts. And I also have a, a question for, to share with you. It's about the idea of a street, I said before. For us in Barcelona, the idea of a street is absolutely essential. We, we have a, a tradition of continuous facades uh, and a street really, uh, really clear for everyone. My feeling in Rotterdam is not really clear which is the idea of a street. We have to be critical. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't have really, I don't have clear where is the the, the idea of a street. We because. What, what is not clear about the idea the of the street in The relation between buildings, the relation between buildings that, that finally define which is a street. So uh, the city is not a, a building next to a next building, next to a next building. The city is what is happening between them and the buildings need to talk to each other. So, so to create the conditions and the relations. Uh, Rotterdam has a really uh, open uh, urban fabric structure. So there is a lot of public space. And probably the idea of a street is quite different than the idea that we have in some mm. ways. So you're but saying I there's would not like enough... to exchange about the idea because I'm for sure that it's not right, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying there's not enough uh, uh, connection? Probably, probably it's, a, it's a matter of density. And I know uh -huh. that the city is working, increasing density all yeah. around different neighborhoods. So and Barcelona, of course, is very dense. Yeah, Oof. too much in some, in some <laughs> neighborhoods, probably. But I think the idea of a street could be a good strategy in order to create more new density in Rotterdam, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. um, the first uh, super block that was uh, uh, created in 2016 in, uh, in your neighborhood, Sylvia, was the first of what was then a plan for 500 superblocks in the city. Huge ambition. What's going to happen if Mayor Arakalao leaves office? Well, this plan, the mobility plan that planned the 500 superblocks is from 2013. Before she came? Before she came. And we just approved a new mobility plan. And the, the, I think the transformation is not stoppable. I mean, uh, people are demanding more and more superblocks. Last year we had, the, for the first time in Barcelona, the participatory budgets. And four of the most voted projects were superblocks. So we are now working you know, with these action plans with the neighbors to, yeah, to work with the, the actions for, the new, for these new four superblocks. People know the concept of the superblock. We can call it superblock, we can call it uh, Bunerf, we can call it no, whatever. But people know the, this concept, no? the, it's good for them. It's good for the, for, the, for the quality of life, it's good for their health. Mm. And now they've experienced, no? Because yeah. in, in the beginning, in 2016, with the, with the first pilot, it came just no, all of a sudden and no one understood what was going on. Yeah, and the first one you told me uh, was a kind of guerrilla attack. It was realized in the weekend. Nobody mm. was around. Mm. They came back and they thought, what happened here? Mm. Well, after summer holidays. Yeah, after summer holidays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it was a, a, a strategically chosen moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I thought that was interesting also because, uh, Sylvia, you yourself are not an architect. You're an environmental scientist by training. And you're an inhabitant of that neighbor. So you were involved in this in every possible way. And I know that not everybody in your neighborhood was happy then. No, some neighbors were claiming their right to drive straight in all the streets, for instance. Really, yeah, like a right. Need, we need to know that air pollution is killing people mm. right now in Barcelona and probably in other cities around the world. So it's not a matter of um, improved landscape or, or well, beauty in the city. It's about uh, health. 
issue that we need to, to tackle and to improve because we are, I think there are 1,000 uh, deaths every year, probably because yeah. of the air pollution. So 1,000 deaths every year yeah. through the pollution. Yeah. 1,300 in, in the metropolitan area, yeah, yeah. Ah. So I think, as Sylvia said, it's unstoppable because we, I think people, even more after the COVID crisis, mm -hmm. is more aware about that the health need to be in the center of different urban policies, mm -hmm. also in urban, of course. So I think that um, Superblock will continue faster or slower. No matter probably. who's mayor. But, yeah. but if Alacola, of course, uh, continue, um, the model is the one that we said before. Yeah. So it will really clear that the city will continue with this transformation. Mm -hmm. I thought one of the motives for the Superblock was uh, yes, also health, but definitely also social, to give people a place to sit together, to create space for play, for children to be out on the street safely. Um, has that worked out as you had hoped it would? Well, I guess we didn't expect the social, this big social impact. In the beginning, it was just no, a question of changing mobility and creating no, some new spaces. But we didn't expect, you know, like in Poblenou or in Sant Antoni, the, the, the big impact on social activity and social new relationships among the neighborhood. This is really, really amazing. And that's, I think that's the biggest change in, in the end. No? Mm -hmm. you, you create uh, yeah, the conditions for the life to come. In Sant Antoni, now, for instance, we've got every, every day uh, chess tournaments. The autonomous, I mean, they organize themselves, no? just the people. Just so this was this is amazing that it's happening, no? And just just to create, for instance, no, the picnic tables for me are the most democratic symbol, no, <laughs> as a urban element because you provide the conditions for everyone to use the public space for for a birthday party, for a dinner with the friends. Uh, my my children, no, they are now 18. They were having dinner two days ago in the in the super block with the friends. It's like they don't need to spend money, no, in in a place they can just hang hang around in a and it's a safe place also no the, from a gender perspective we are we we are also creating this this new space where social contact makes makes it uh, more secure more safe so it's yeah, it's all, a win win yeah, project yeah, we could also talk about commercial activity or retail in the super block areas because some of the, those groups that are complaining against uh, Superblock, mm -hmm. used to say that Superblocks will, will kill the commercial activity, will be the, the final for these retail activities. Mm -hmm. But in San Antonio, it has been demonstrated that that kind of transformation improved the conditions for the commercial activities. Because so, there were more people yeah, walking. Yeah, there are more people mm -hmm. walking in front of the different commercial activities. They are increasing the, the selling. Yeah. So. It's and also in, a really good uh, transformation for this proximity activity mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. different neighborhoods. In fact, in Poblenou Superblock, the data says no, in 2016, there were only 20 commercial activities on the ground floor, and yeah. now there are more than 80. 80? 80. 80. From 20, yeah. 20 to 80. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's like, well, if this was supposed to be bad for the retailers, <laughs> I don't think it's working in this way. So. <laughs> Um, one thing I've wondered about the, the, the traffic model of the Superblocks, Xavi, is I understand that when you, uh, you cut through traffic and you move traffic out of the center of the Superblock, you're actually redistributing traffic. But are you also decreasing traffic? Are there fewer cars just because it's a different distribution? Yeah, not only because it's different distribution, but also because we are also improving the streets in the perimeter of the superblock. So the idea of superblock is not only to improve the streets within the area of superblock, but also the streets that are in the perimeter where we are reducing car lanes, introducing bike lanes, improving public transport conditions. So the idea is that before we reduce the room for cars, we are improving public transport, we are improving uh, the, 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 the bike structure in the city. In so you're order, giving people alternatives. Okay, exactly. Uh -huh, in order uh -huh. to make it easier to invite people mm -hmm. to change, to leave a car at home and mm -hmm. to take the bike. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Tracy, for instance, in Sant Antonio Superblock, in the beginning, in one of the streets of the perimeter streets, that it's the typical fallacy, no? Oh, the, the perimeter streets get more traffic. That was true. In the beginning, uh, it got more traffic, 20% of more traffic. But then COVID came, then after COVID came, 
And now, nowadays, we're counting less cars than before the superblock was there, also in the experiments by street. So, in the end, the time... Well, it was less cars because nobody yeah, was so going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a real evaporation. No, so, but yeah. there is. I mean, the, when that's not the evaporation of traffic, you know about this. It's existing. I mean, when you take out space for the cars, for parking, for driving, I mean, in the end... Mm. In the interview, and then we're going to our, our last two uh, remarks. In the interview on the uh, website of the Stotsmakers Congress, really interesting interview with uh, both of you. If you haven't read it, I'd really recommend it. You say that now 60% of public space in Barcelona is still reserved for cars, 60%. How will that be when all the super blocks have been realized? What is your ultimate goal? A really good question, Tracy. <laughs> we don't have the, the, the figure about that, but probably it, would be, it will be not residual, but probably it will be inside out. So we yeah, will be for, probably at 40% for uh, mobility and 60% yeah. for, for people. Mm -hmm. And there is also no important issue about this change that is about the materials. We have a 60% of the public space surface for cars, but also with asphalt. Asphalt probably is the worst material in our cities right now, not only f by its production, but also because it increases the temperature in our cities. So we are also not only changing the, the function of this surface, but also changing the material. So it's also really important to, to take into account. But and anyone who has been to Barcelona knows what beautiful pavement you have. Yeah. On the, the Paseo de Gracia. The sidewalks, the... pavement, yeah. <laughs> um, is this model of the superblock exportable to, for example, Rotterdam? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> because I, I, it's usual that people used to say us that we don't have this regular grid as Barcelona, so it's not this. But the idea is not about this uh, urban fabric structure. It's about how can we reduce the space for mobility in our cities. And this is really important, and we tried to explain it before, that we need to rebuild our cities with more centralities in order to reduce the need of mobility in first, uh, first, uh, as a first idea, but also we need to, to, to improve the conditions of this same public space. So I think it's possible in, in every city to reduce the space that they need for mobility, for sure. And this is not something a uh, Barcelona invention. I think, I guess, architects like Buchanan uh, many years ago already you know, developed this concept of superblock. And when I look at the Netherlands and I look at the Wunerfs, okay, it's not exactly superblock, but it's work. I mean, in the mobility terms, it's working as superblock. It's not working as superblock with the social life and with the greening, but it's also half way of a, of a superblock. So it's, I mean, I think all the cities in the world are implementing already this concept, this concept of superblocks in all towns, for instance, no? Where it's very clear where, what's the hierarchy of the streets. But in the case of Barcelona, of course, because we've got all this grid of this, all these 20 meters wide streets, we need to put no, the technical hierarchy. This is like, this is a street for cars, this is a street for people, this is a street for the, for the greenery. But this concept is some, yeah, some developed concept already for many years, like no, from the urban planning. So it, this is like, okay, Barcelona, it was very clear how we were doing this process. Um, but of course, it's for every city in the world. Yeah, in fact, we are involved in a group team also with Rotterdam, mm -hmm. among other cities of Europe, working all together on how to unfold the idea of superblock of mm -hmm. different cities. Mm -hmm. And what I find so inspiring about this is, is my way of thanking you and, and, and what your city has done is that this has been such a successful exercise in imagining how it could be. If you look at the images of the Meridiana and also the Diagonal, which used to be just this huge traffic, Verkeersriool, who said that? <laughs> uh, and now it's green, and you know what really makes a difference? Old ladies dare to cross the street now on the Diagonal. They didn't yeah, yeah, used yeah. to. It, yeah, they yeah, were yeah, taking their life difficult. in their hands. True. And the exercise of imagination, and then making this imagination into a reality on a daily level, I think is really something that uh, uh, Barcelona is to be congratulated for. So thank you on my own behalf. Thank and you I so much. think on... Our behalf as well. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're off to have that beer that we've all been looking forward to, and Xavi and Sylvia will be here to answer 
all your questions about how they do it in Barcelona and how Rotterdam can replicate that good example. Thanks very much.